Welcome to Cliff Chats. Today I talk with Royal Hardigan. Royal is a pioneer in drum set and African rhythms and combining the two. He is passionate about the music he creates and teaches, and he pays homage and has respect for the traditions he has learned from. Two huge influences for Royal have been African American music and West African musical traditions, specifically music from Ghana. His experiences with cultural luminaries Max Roach, Ed Blackwell, Duke Ellington, and many others were pivotal to his development, and he carries on the tradition of fostering an open and giving spirit to students, music appreciators, and everyone he encounters. Well, thank you so much for being here, or being, I know we're in two different places, but being yeah. here uh, virtually. Um, so I, I, I was learning more about you. I, I first discovered you from your book, um, West African Rhythms for Drum Set. Okay. I've had, oh, okay. I've had my copy for probably sh- maybe 20 years. How long has it been out now? I think it was 95. So that's, yeah, that's about right. And yeah. uh, I have three others that are out and hopefully another one after that. Uh-huh. So that'll be coming out hopefully as eBooks in the next year or so, if I can find someone that knows how to do it. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that, that whole that whole I know that's changed a lot too, and we could talk about that as well. Uh, yeah. So, so it sounds like tap dance. You had family that tap danced and played music. Um. So, so what was your first memory of of music? Yeah, um, my mom and my uncle Hazel Hardigan and Ray Hart. And my my uncle had my the same name as me, Royal Hardigan, but he shortened it for the Marquis literally 100, 110 years ago, I was a young, they had me late in life, and um, he had to shorten his name, Royal Hardigan, to fit on the marquees in the mm-hmm. traveling shows and so all those uh, stage shows around the world. He traveled everywhere. And so he changed, shortened it to Ray Hart. But they were really good tap dancers. He was incredible. And my mother learned from him, and they taught and performed professionally together. So my earliest memories are as two, three years old, hearing them tap dance. And I started at three and I never achieved uh, the level that they did. I was mediocre at best, but I uh, loved it. From whenever I would dance, even a Grange Hall or a little community club or auditorium, often there were footlights and you'd see the people in the audience and it seemed as if the beyond the wooden floors or the tap mats and the sounds of the tap dance and the music, beyond those lights was were people that you felt connected to. Mm-hmm. And by extension, it felt like it reached out to the whole world, even though it didn't. Uh, it was just, you know, usually one little venue, but it felt like that. And it was exciting. It made me feel connected to myself and other people in a way that at a young age of three or four is not common. And it, beca- it was special to me. It, ha- it was magic, basically. And uh, that feeling has stayed with me since then. Uh, and I later started playing drum set, well, drums actually in a drum corps first and band, and then piano, mostly jazz. Uh-huh. And I played my way through high school and college playing piano and trios or quartets for dancing and sometimes jazz, and then develop my drum set a little later. Um, but it was uh, always magic. And that was the reason I did it uh, for its own sake. I didn't, you know, you get paid. Yeah, great. But you weren't aspiring to fame. Is that right? Or were you, was I that? I wasn't aspiring to fame or quote unquote success or any of that stuff. Uh-huh. Just, just, it was such a joy to do it. And it still is. It, that hasn't changed. Uh, uh-huh. So, so your uncle, you said he toured around the world, with, so, and it was it was under his name, Ray Hart. You said, yeah, he took the name Ray Hart because he shortened Royal to Ray to make uh, it. Royal, the fit on the so and I'm Royal James, and he just made it all a lot shorter. And um, people knew him all over the world. He taught the Ziegfeld family's daughter out in Hollywood. He, at that time, there were clog, Irish clog dancing championships. Mm-hmm. in Madison Square Garden. He won a couple of years. He had, the family was, uh, f- came from Ireland 150 years ago. And they, then he lived in Worcester and took a train down to New York 
to earn money for the family. And he would tap dance on the street, on the sidewalks. He knew a lot of the greats and danced with many of them. Mm -hmm. He knew Bill Robinson. He danced with uh, Pegleg Bates, the Step Brothers, the Nicholas Brothers. Uh, he told me stories about going all over the world, Australia, and just uh, incredible life. And that added to my sense of magic in music and tap dance because the things he told me, I said, wow, this isn't things you see every day. Mm -hmm. And so I was really inspired and motivated by he and my mother's work. And uh, So was it like a variety act? Yeah, right. Uh, he used to do solo when he was traveling all over the world. But then when he retired in around 19, sometime in the early 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, he retired to a, a place in Western Mass, North Adams, Massachusetts. And he just happened to have a card from my grandparents who went out to see him, happened to see him when he was in Portland, Oregon, I think. They were out okay. there in the winter having a vacation. And they went at, back after and they gave him their cards. If you're ever in the Berkshires, come and stay with us. And he did. And then he liked it so much, he stayed there and started dancing studios. My mother took tap dance from him and uh -huh. she became so good. They used to teach together and dance together professionally. Uh huh. So so it was it, it was growing up just a big part of your family, family's life. Uh, yes. And so you said that that. You, so you started tap dancing at an early age and then playing piano. And so was it the sort of situation where your parents said, okay, you need to play an instrument and we want you to play piano or how did, how, what was that like? They weren't really pushing me on it, but my mother, uh, they knew I liked from the tap dance, they knew I liked drums. So uh, I just drum all the time and they got me a single drum. And then eventually in uh, junior and high school, they bought me a drum set and I went crazy. I said, oh my God. Um, my mother had seen enough, uh, you know, worked with musicians. She played, in addition to tap dancing, she played uh, C melody sax, really good ear and a tone on violin. And mm -hmm. my uncle, he played ukulele, a cello, and played a little piano and banjo. I still have his banjo. And um, so they knew, uh, you know, a lot about the musical side of the dancing. And they said to me, you know, if you really want to do things in music, piano is a great way to start because you get, it's all there in front of you. You can see what melodies are like and chords and how forms go. So I, I took piano and uh, I really enjoyed that as well as the drumming and the tap dance. It sounds like you have such a great foundation. Mm -hmm. it, have you, by the way, have you seen Bela Fleck's film about the banjo and his trip to- yes. Yeah, yeah, it's so good, very cool. <laughs> yeah, he's here in Nashville. Um, yeah. So so you, um, when you got the drum set, who were some of the some of the influential um, bands or musicians for you? I was lucky. Living in Western Mass, you wouldn't think there was a lot going on. But in those days, in the 50s and 60s, there was a place called the Music Inn. And it was in Lenox, a suburb of Pittsfield, which was a town next to Pittsfield. And it was right across the street from the summer home of the Boston Symphony, Tanglewood. And at this place... Uh, and, well, it was just down the road, not quite across the street. And uh, this uh, music in every Sunday, all summer from like late June till Labor Day would have these great players from New York come up and you could sit like five feet away from them. And it was, you know, just a little raised stage, grand piano. Every year we'd see Dave Brubeck, Thelonious Monk, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Buddy Rich, Duke Ellington, Lionel Hampton, Woody Herman, my God, who are the other, so many people, uh, modern jazz quartet, just, you know, you're right there in, in, on the intermission, you could talk to them. Oh, wow. said, Man, it sounded great. You know, I mean, it drove me out. I couldn't believe it, you know? So that's, that's, yeah. it's, like, it's like you grew up being able to see Beethoven or Bach. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And the drummer, you know, I loved all the musicians, the pianist, the drummer, all the but I heard so many great drummers. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just wonderful. Um, and then later, interestingly, around 65, I was playing my way through college at the Holiday Inn Eagle's Nest in Lenox, Massachusetts. And in August, they have the Pops every year in the BSO. So that year, Duke Ellington's band played with the Pops with Arthur Fiedler. Little did I know, here I am playing piano in the Eagle's Nest Lounge and in walk-in, about 18 impeccably dressed musicians, many with their saxophone and trumpet case, 
with tuxedos and they sit down and they order, you know, whatever. And I'm playing and I look up and I says, oh my God, that's Duke Ellington's orchestra. Wow. I'm playing piano. What are they, they're going to throw things at me. <laughs> actually, I went over and talked to them and they were really nice to me. And I went out in the hallway and I called up my parents. I said, mom and dad, Duke Ellington's band just came in. And um, so what happens? I hang up the phone and who's walking down the corridor is Duke Ellington. Red uh, carnation in his lapel. He looked like... They, they called him Duke. It, it's, it, it's appropriate. Uh -huh. He talked, he acted, he walked like royalty. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had the courage. He was talking to somebody when, when he left that person. I went over to him and said, Mr. Ellington, could I please shake your hand? I know you're busy and you're famous, but I'd love to just shake your hand because you, you know, are a legend to me. And he stopped me. He said, what's your name? And I said, Royal. And he says, you know, Royal, you're pretty special. He said, we're all learning together. And he went on and he made me feel right at home. And I was amazed. You know, I had this idea of being, you know, I was probably 18 or whatever. Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's these people, you know, that are the gods. Um, but when you meet them in person, they make you feel like, you know, there's no difference. And it's really true. They're great musicians, but they're also human beings. Mm -hmm. And they were so open, like Duke Ellington, when I spoke with Joe Morello, uh, when I spoke with Thelonious Monk, who was really cool. And his huh. at the time was Frankie Dunlop. And then another time he came, he had um, Ben Riley, Charlie Rouse. You know, it, just talking to these people, it, it inspires you. Yeah. Um, and for people, for people listening in who maybe aren't familiar with all these people, Joe Morello was best known for playing with Dave Brubeck. Yes. Um, you may be familiar with Take Five, which was their biggest hit. Um, and then, and then, well, so Thelonious Monk, what was that conversation like? Oh my God. I, I talked to him about, uh, what actually what he did, what I always noticed. And I just said, I really like the way you move. And he said, oh man, yeah, that's cool. Um, because he would get up not every time, but what, you know, when he's doing a solo, he's there, but when it's a drum solo or a bass solo or a sax solo, Sometimes he would get up and, you know, the grand pianos like nine feet. He would walk up and down, back and forth. But the way he walked, it wasn't really just walk. It was like almost dancing to the music that he heard. I've seen a video of him performing and he's dancing. Oh, yeah. And he's dancing and he's literally dancing, walking. And some people would say, well, why is he doing that? But my work in West Africa, drumming music and dance are one it's not two separate things mm -hmm. you have to know both and so to me i saw the relation in a different way of course in west africa it's exact you know there's dance movements that go with drum rhythms but he was doing maybe not specific traditional movements with certain rhythms but they were still related and it was mm -hmm. incredible it was like a kind of genius to me and i was just man i was knocked out yeah. Uh, uh, so it, it, and then later with Max Ro when I was at UMass Amherst uh -huh. I was just so lucky again uh, in the 70s and 80s to be around master artists a great uh, educator Dr. Frederick Tillis who is uh, in charge of bringing master artists up from New York he brought Reggie Workman the bassist Max Roach the drummer and Archie Shep the saxophonist later mm -hmm. Yusuf Latif and others but I was close to uh Archie and Max and Reggie, and uh, they always, you know, encouraged me to play. They treated you, you know, you just like they'd known me for a hundred years. And, you know, it's just, man, it makes you want to play all night and not. Mm -hmm. So was, of, was um, you know, st coming up in the sixties playing drum set was, was rock an influence or were you just really tuned to jazz? Uh, I heard rock. It, it hit when the Beatles came. I was in high school and I in 64, maybe, I mm -hmm. think. And, and I enjoyed it as a different style. Mm -hmm. but I felt in my heart I had already found my musical home, mm -hmm. which was the African-American tradition we know as jazz. There was something about that that just I didn't find in rock. There was a complete spontaneity. It, in other words, in rock, I, I'm sure... I, well, I know there are styles where you can have some level of improvisation and sometimes it's quite extensive, but in, 
jazz at any moment, or at least the jazz that I've listened to and I try to play, at any moment, anything can go anywhere. Mm. And it's completely open. So there's uh, a different uh, level of freedom, maybe? Yeah. Uh, there are some styles like bebop where you have a vocabulary that's somewhat, that has a definite vocabulary, which mm -hmm. that's cool too. But as I hear jazz as being far more open. And even when all the musical logic says, here we go, this is going to go here, this is going to go here, and the next step would logically be here. In jazz, if you feel like it and other people do, you can go 180 degrees the opposite way. You can, mm -hmm. It's what uh, our pianist in Blood Drum Spirit, Art Hirahara, talks about as being truth in the moment. That at every moment, anything can go anywhere. And to me, that's the ultimate expression of life, of arts, and of people's hearts. And so that is my main thing. Now, I do love funk and the hip hop things going on. And, you know, I try to adapt those things into jazz. So I would say that I enjoy and like all those different styles, reggae, you know, Afro beats, uh, high life. They're all got their own beautiful way of expressing things. But for me, my main approach is to take those things and put them into the tradition where I feel the freest to be able to go anywhere at any moment. Mm -hmm. And I love how succinct, succinct that is, truth in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. Uh, so, yeah. so you played drum set and um, where, so how, did you always know you wanted to be a professional musician? Did you want to be an educator? What, what were you in, um, envisioning for yourself? Well, when I was in college, believe it or not, I wanted to be a priest. Uh huh. Uh, mostly, not necessarily for the ritual, but I grew up thinking that, or at least the priest that I knew, could really help people. Uh huh. And I wanted to help people here and all over the world. Um, then, as I went through changes in college that made it harder and harder to. Uh, want to do that. Mm -hmm. I uh, had a hard time believing in God. I had to take philosophy as a, to be a priest uh -huh. and the philosophy, they talk about all the arguments and, you know, whether there's a God or not. And I just, at one point, I just said that maybe there isn't a God. And then I went to the Peace Corps after college and saw the horror of the world. You know, we mm -hmm. have the American dream, but the rest of the world has a global nightmare. Mm -hmm. side of what's happening throughout the third world right now in the Ukraine, the horrors that are going on. And I came back saying, my God, how can there be a God? How can there be meaning? Um, and then about a year or two later, I went over to UMass. A friend of mine told me about a concert with McCoy Tyner, the great pianist for John Coltrane, mm -hmm. former Alphonse Muzon, who mm -hmm. I'd never heard before. Uh, bassist Calvin Hill and saxophonist Sonny Fortune. Well, they played in the UMass Student Union Ballroom. It was packed. There was intensity in the air and they played for about, it was so strong, they played for four hours. Wow. They played two suites with only one break. It was take no prisoners. It was like, what is this? I said to myself, I don't know if there's a God, I don't know if there's any meaning. I don't even sometimes know if I exist, mm -hmm. but I know what that is. And whatever that is, I want to give my life to it. At that mm -hmm. moment, it was March 70 something. And, uh, and, and for people, may, McCoy Tyner was well known for playing with John Coltrane. Oh yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, I met McCoy Tyner. Um, he was playing where I used to live in, in North Carolina. And, um, and I talked to him a little bit. I asked him, what is the groove to you? Uh, but, but I didn't get an answer, but anyway, so, so, uh, so that, that experience could maybe be described as a spiritual experience though. You, yeah. And, and since then I've come to feel that there at least can be, and maybe is some deeper spiritual, uh, being God, spirit, goodness, something 
Uh, and that's reinforced since 1991 when I've been going to Ghana, West Africa and to Asian countries to do my research and performing in China, the Philippines, Korea, Japan, so forth, um, in the villages, not in the urban tourist, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, or business, it, out in the villages with the people. There's a closeness and a connection to nature and a spirit world that I can feel. So I now have a sense that there is something beyond. I just don't know anything about it, but I feel it. And the beauty part of it is that in, in indigenous cultures, the people use music as part of their lives. And one of the main things is that expression of spirit in the music. So I try to put that in music that I play. Mm -hmm. So you heard so you heard McCoy Tyner play with all these great musicians and ha sounds like sort of an epiphany as well. Um, and that you wanted to devote your life to that. So where, when was your, when did you first hear music from Africa? Uh, I heard it when I was a little bit, when I was at UMass Amherst, they had visiting people come through, mm -hmm. but uh, regularly I heard it when I went to uh, Wesleyan in Middletown, Connecticut for my master's and PhD. I started that in 1981. Okay. And they had, a great music department with master artists from different traditions, Japan, mm -hmm. India, China, Native America, uh, I've said Indonesian gamelan and uh, West Africa, mm -hmm. Ghana, uh, master drummer. So you, were, you were learning bits of each of those um, music, uh, different cultures or from around the world. Yes, I did my best. There's only so much you can do. That's the problem <laughs> at a place like Wesleyan. <laughs> you wanted to learn them all. You just can't do it. Yeah. So I focused each on one of those takes a lifetime. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, even <laughs> one of them, you could spend 10 lifetimes and you'd yeah. still be scratching the surface. But, yeah. you know, I said, how can you not try to do it? So I went India. Uh, Murdungam in South India is a beautiful instrument. It's the counterpart to the tabla. But my teacher, Tanjur Ranganathan, a master artist, uh, he said, you can do that, but there's so much time to make, take and you're already doing these other things. You could try the salt rhythmic syllables called in the South Solkatu over mm -hmm. the time cycles, and so forth. And so that's what I did. And I adapted it to drum set. In Javanese gamelan, I played sometimes the drums and other instruments. And in West African drumming, I needed to learn the dance to understand the full thing. So I did this uh, support drumming in the dance and later uh, with permission, the lead drumming with Abraham Kobana Adzinia and Freeman Quadzo Donkor, who uh, all of them were really beautiful. They said, I, I asked them, I said, because I don't want to, you know, be perceived as just some outsider stealing your stuff. Mm -hmm. So, because there's a history of that, uh, of people coming and grabbing stuff. How did, how did you become aware of that, of appropriate cultural uh, appropriation? At UMass Amherst with Reggie, Max, and Archie. Um, I, in, along with our musical studies, we had uh, both formal and informal discussions about music and culture and politics and so forth. And I realized through my readings and talking to them that there was a history of people that go into world cultures, including African-American music, and come out as Mr. Africa, Mr. Gamelan, Mr. whatever. And I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, kings of jazz, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'll never be a king of anything, but I just wanted to make sure it was right. And after the Peace Corps, the Peace Corps uh, made me aware of another culture because you live with the people for two years. It's not like in some business park or government thing or, you know, tourist hotel. It's like right in the village. You eat the food they eat. And you were, and you were, you were where in the Peace Corps? I was, oh, sorry, I was in the Philippines. I worked in education a little, but then as a medical social worker, an informal medical social worker. And uh, I, I saw the culture from the inside. I wasn't of it, but I was in it. And that being in it was enough to change my life and uh, try to do something else. And so that cultural connection combined with my musical connection with Max Roach, Archie Shep, Reggie Workman, and all the others, and then at Wesleyan with World, with with the master artists, all of that together helped form my my 
well, really my life before anything else, but my music is an expression of that. And uh, I've dedicated myself to that uh, since then and try to do what I can. Uh, I can, I'll be the first to tell you that I'm not an expert in any of it. Uh, I'm learning, I'm really a student, um, trying to make the music real and play it as much as I can uh, with, the, with heart. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, this is, this is a little bit of, of a different subject, but just curious, Royal, what's the origin of your name? Uh, I actually don't know. Uh, my uncle, my father's brother, was given that name and not sure why from their father in Worcester, Mass. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like an English name. My father's family was Irish. My mom's French. So I'm not sure why, but they gave it to him. And then my mom and dad didn't want to call me junior. So they named me after my uncle. Uh -huh. I tell you that I don't live up to it, but uh, it's a nice, it's a different name. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and, and I'm sure you do live up to it and you're doing what you do. Um, so, so you had your first experiences with African music learning from master teachers uh, at, you said at Wesleyan? Yes. Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Um, uh -huh. And so, and so when, and, and so how long did you do that for? And then when, um, when did you make your first trip to Ghana? Good. Yeah. Uh, I, Got my MA, I was there in 81, and then I got my MA in 83 and PhD in 86, and mm. taught for a few years uh, until 93 when I went to San Jose and taught at San Jose State. From and, and at this point, you were teaching, what were you teaching at this point? Or I taught world music and African-American music mm -hmm. slash jazz mm -hmm. and, um, with ensembles, though. I taught a large and small ensemble at San Jose State <clears throat> and African drumming and dance with the master drummer out there in the Bay Area, known as, uh, his name is C.K. Ladzekpo. Yeah, I've heard his name. Uh, yeah. He's a famous, great drummer with his wife, Betty, um, who's a dancer. Um, so I started going in 1991. Uh -huh. I would bring, that was myself, and then starting in around 1994, just about every year, I would bring students from San Jose State. And then when I went to UMass Dartmouth in 1999, uh, I started three years later in 2002 to bring students almost every year. Sometimes I would go twice a year. And then I got a uh, Fulbright in 2006 to go to the Philippines. Uh -huh. I went to Ghana in 2013 as a visiting faculty for a year and then followed that with a year in Fulbright. So I was there for two years from 2013 to 2015. And then we went with students until 2018 and then the COVID hit. So it's been sort of tough, but I plan on going back again as soon as it's a little bit more cleared up. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you also had a, a, some, some, you had met in new Ed Blackwell or Edward Blackwell, the drummer. Yes. I should tell you about that too. At Wesleyan, in addition to the world artists, there was a couple of wonderful uh, jazz players, Bill Barron, the brother of Kenny Barron, was on the faculty there, and Bill Lowe, trombone, uh, trombonist Bill Lowe, Fred Simmons, a pianist, and for drums, my teacher was Ed Blackwell. Uh, and and for people who maybe who aren't familiar with him, he he's he was from New Orleans. Yes, he was, and um, one of the great drum set players of all time. Oh, incredible! And his sister, who I met, was a tap dancer, and uh, she brought me to his house when I went down there. Uh, to give a talk with C.K. Lezekpo on African drumming and jazz. And um, wonderful guy, open, just like Max and Duke Elk, just open-hearted. And mm -hmm. he he would share this excitement with you. You know, you, I go to his house for the lessons and he say, hey, try this out, Royal. Bum, bum, bum. So I go and try it. Isn't that cool? You know, I mean, he, he's just like, he's discovering it with you. Mm -hmm. that, sort of, that taught me, that helped me in teaching to be a, it's not wrong to be excited about and love what you do and share it with students and be open about it. You don't have to, you know, you get this thing of the, in a university or professor, you have to be like so objective and all that stuff. I can't do that. I, and, I and, and be the authority. You are the authority. And that could, that that's, puts a boundary between you. and I, just, I like to share it and here it is. I'm excited about it. Check it out. Let's talk about it. If you disagree with me, good. I want you to, here's uh -huh. my stuff. I'll give you my thoughts and, it like that. And uh, now that I'm retired, I missed that. Although uh -huh. I do residencies, but uh, 
that's, I think, for me at least, the best way to teach, just the way Max and Archie and Reggie and Dr. Tillis and uh, Bill Lowe, Bill Barron, um, Ed Blackwell, they all uh, just were totally open. And, uh-huh. and so how, when you started to learn African music, when you started learning about different different cultures and the music, um, how did that influence your your drumming? And I think I'm frozen. Um, um, at first, it was... Okay, so I just asked you about how African drumming, learning about that had changed and influenced your your drum set playing and music that you were doing. Yeah, um, at first, and still is, uh, I hear the rhythms, the bell, the rattle, the support drums, the lead drums, and I adapt those specific rhythms to the drum set. For example, it makes sense to adapt uh, the bell rhythm you can do it anywhere, but it's a metal bell. So the metal rims or the metal symbols make sense. The mm-hmm. different tones of the drums. Well, the drum set has at least four tones, bass, mounted, to, uh, mounted floor and snare, and other timbres. That's one of the unique things about the drum set. It's an instrument of not just rhythm, but timbre, accent, dynamics, and pitch. Max Roach always played and reminded us that the drum set is a melodic instrument. It's Mm -hmm. not, don't let anybody tell you it's not, it's a melodic instrument. It's a melodic instrument in a different way. It doesn't have like a scale. I mean, you could do that and some people do, that's cool, but it's a different kind of scale, which for me is more interesting than Mm -hmm. each discrete note. You can tune your drums or not to different areas rather than a single focus pitch. And the way you hit it, where you hit it, if you mute it or whatever else you do, creates a different pitch and timbre. And that is so unique. And that's even true of cymbals in a way, where you hit them, what you hit it with. You know, I mean, that's- How you hit them. (laughs) Yeah, there's hundreds of notes in the drum set. Man, there's, you know, it's really cool. So let me give you an example, if I could, with the drums that are here. Um, I'll just step over here and I'll demonstrate something. Just a conversation among the drums and how they relate to language. I'll give an invocation in language. Okay. This is an invocation in the Asante Chui language of the Asante people of Ghana, West Africa. And the language is tonal, so you can play it on the drums. And this is with permission from my teacher, Ata Poku. Yesia, mommy hanu. Yesia, mommy hanu. Yesia, mommy hanu. Twenty four, kadua. Off and bang. Demini fat, way. Demini fat, way. Demini fat, way, way. Twenty three, ni. Amya ne hunu. Off and bang. Yemao a kwapa. Aruroko fi. And this would be played before the social or funeral music known as Adowa. I'd like to give you just a little, oh, and the language means uh, honored person. We feel good toward you. You have gone through life and all its struggles to your death or to your destiny. And we salute you, we honor you, honored person. And now I'd like to play a dialogue from the royal court music of the Asante people. There are many drums in the ensemble, but the two that share the dialogue are the lead drums. There's an hourglass dono and some other drums. This is a bell, a hollow metal bell called Dauro. And here's the bell pattern. I'll just, you're not supposed to count, but because we don't have a lot of time, I'll count. 12 eighth, 12 dotted, 12 eighth notes in Western terms, if you were writing it, divided into four dotted quarter notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, nine, 10, 11, 12. One, two, three, four. Okay, that is the heartbeat, the bell pattern. 
And now I'll play the dialogue, if you can still imagine that in your head, that goes on a very basic part of a long section of the royal court music known as Fom Tom From. And this section is called Ato Piretia. So the bell would be here. conversation in the music known as Fontam from. And I have to also say, you would never play these like this. Uh, I've been given permission by Atapoku and another master artist, Kwabana Boateng, to, for demonstration purposes, to do this. But in actual fact, these would only be played one person here, and each of these large drums would have one drummer as well. And as there would be one person playing the Dauro bell. Well, yeah. So the ensemble would have three people playing the bell and then that the two sets of drums? Yeah, normally there would be one or two people on the daro, often two. Uh -huh. In this music, there isn't always a rattle, an interwa gourd rattle, but in others there are. And then you have that conversation, which is the essence of fang fang drum, uh -huh. and atumpang. And then there are two other drums, a small drum that looks similar to this. This isn't it, but it's something like this called okay. atumpang. Say it again. A uh -huh. And then there's an hourglass drum that I can show you in the other room that's called Dono. And that also has a voice uh, in this music of Fontan from. Uh huh. Uh, so in um, in 2005, I was in Ghana and I and I heard some oh. music like that. Oh, um, so deep. Yeah. And so, so and I, I had I had Ghanaian teachers. I lived in Portland, Oregon for many years. And, um, oh. and Oboadi had brought so oh. many. Um, and I played with Oboadi for a while and his nephew Chata. Oh. And, um, but uh, but they um, they called it Dono as also as well. But but then when I, I went when I was in Northern. Um, oh, yeah. Luna. Uh, Luna. Yeah. Luna, yeah. So so different different um, cultures have different different names for the for. Yeah. Is it the same or is it a little bit different? The, the instruments? No, it's just, it's just a different name. It's a different name, yeah. And each each area has their own construction of it, but it's basically the same. Uh, and, and I know it's also called Tama in other you know other areas of and um and they can look different and be a little bit different in Nigeria as opposed to in, oh, yeah. in Guinea and. Yeah. And they're made out of they're they're um some I mean, very often different sizes because mm -hmm. some of the sizes are quite uh quite uh intense. I mean they're really big. I've seen yeah. some quite large. And yeah. then some are much smaller. Uh, in fact, there's a thing I might demonstrate a little here with the, the dono or lunga and the bass drum. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, maybe you can. Yeah. Yep. You can see Let your drum. This. Let's see here. Make sure this is all the way up. Can you see me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, this is the lunga or dono. And one of the ways I, I, I was going to talk about adapting the rhythms, the bell and all that, which we will do, but here's one example. I'll do a short one. The, the lunga, I'm sure you are, uh, have seen where it dialogues with the big gungong cylindrical drum. Well, because like a bass drum. In the other room, but 
for drum set, I put the, the goong gong basic pattern on a bass drum and then the lunga on the lunga. Uh -huh. And I add sometimes what, if there is a rattle, I add that on the hi hat. Or if there isn't, I just add another layer of time. So mm -hmm. I'll just do a little tiny thing so we can hear a little bit of what it's like. This is from the north, uh, from Dagbamba, and also from other peoples as well, Dagara. So it's. example of how again with permission you can adapt from the gungong and lunga repertoire to the drum set uh some of that i, I learned with a, a wonderful drummer from dark uh you might know him suli imoro who no, I don't uh, know him. Anna, and he gave me all that uh-huh <laughs> Yeah, I, I I went to um, Tamale and and asked for uh, a Bubakar Luna, oh, and oh. and a taxi driver said, "Oh, he's my uncle," uh, and he took me there, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I ended up staying there. But he was very sick at the time, so but but I ended up going to um, to a village uh, Talon to drum, oh. um, just just for a few days. So I don't really recall what I learned in that situation. But but it's, it's it's nice you know it, um yeah it's it's nice to hear what you're doing and thank you for sharing that um it's uh definitely definitely you have been influential um on me and I'm sure many others in the the desire to to take part to what 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 I've learned and and incorporate that into other music and and it's um you know what you're saying about respect and doing it with permission is um it's it's something that's definitely i think important to be considered and it's something i'm i'm still i think processing that what you know what does that mean what does that look like um so what does it for you so so well for one you have a group i think it's is it called blood blood drum spirit yes uh -huh. what what is the what is the meaning of that um, I got that when I first started doing my research in West Africa, and what I thought, I said, what am I going to call my research or my dissertation or my group? And I thought, well, what is it about the music that matters to me? And I felt, well, one thing is the passion that I traced all the way back to tap dancing, piano, uh, McCoy Tyner at UMass, Max, the world artists at Wesleyan going to Ghana, going to Asia, Philippines, and China, the passion. So that's what? Well, that's your blood, your heart. Your, when you're playing, the blood's going through your body. So I thought, okay, blood, that's one thing, blood or heart. And then what do I do? Well, I play drums. So mm -hmm. drum, blood drum. And then, then I thought, well, where does it go to? What's the reason for it? It's not just there. It's why do I do it? What's the purpose? What does it get to? And then I thought, well, it, every time it's a deep thing, it brings me to another place. Uh, in the words of Bill Lowe, a place for the gods to descend when we create music. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, it's spirit. So I put together the heart and passion, the drums that we play, and it all goes towards something beyond us, which I call spirit. And mm -hmm. there are, it's interesting, a deeper 
designs in among the Asante that reflect that. The, the blood, heart, akoma, drum is dono, and spirit is sumsum, sumsum. So mm-hmm. they have designs for those three things. So I use that as the one of the symbols for our group, blood, drum, spirit. Uh huh. And and so uh, I I heard in a other interview that you did, um, you were talking about bringing students to um, uh, Copeia yes. and near Flau. And I and I spent some time there as well. To, oh, yeah. um, would you please just kind of paint a picture of of the Dog Bay Center and and that that area for people? Yes, I went there with when it was uh, begun by Godwin Quissy Agbele, who's unfortunately passed away in 1998. But his son Emmanuel is director, and the people of the village teach there. All great drummers, the teachers, and they teach drumming and dance, and it's uh, traditional. I brought a drum set over in 1995 to, for students to try, as well as myself, to adapting the rhythms right away while we were there. And I think it's still there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, they're very used to Americans and, or your people from outside of Africa, Asia, Middle East, Europe, South America. And um, they have food uh, you know, in, a, in a very, uh, what should we say? The mosquitoes don't get in easy. They have it all screened off and there are, mm-hmm all the hygienic things you need and bucket baths, which I love taking. Uh, just, you know, all the things that make it easier. You don't have to go out and be, have nothing, you know, you, there, there's a, you can sleep with netting and, and screens so that you don't have to worry about any malaria or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's very safe and secure. Uh, and all you feel all day long is, this wonderful way to learn drumming among people that really are open-hearted to you. I can't, I can't uh, uh, recommend it anymore. If I was going to go to one place in Africa, it would be Copeia and Dagbe. Uh, uh-huh. Emmanuel and the drummers are all just, they're just there with you. You feel like, again, like I felt uh, at uh, UMass Amherst and Wesleyan, they just, it feels like you've known them all your life and you just meet them and they're just open. And it's a beautiful part of the culture and the feel of that village and center. And you can walk anywhere in the village and you're cool, you know, they know, oh, there's the drummers, you know, and the, of course, when there's a drumming event, like a funeral or some other event, of course, Emmanuel will arrange, you can go and you can watch it and you can drum. It's mm-hmm. wonderful. So or either there or at a flower denou or some other area nearby. So uh, if anybody is interested in going, uh, that's the place to go. And, and the music is is beautiful and amazing. What I was really intrigued, one thing that really intrigued me was the uh, the the dialogue and how how one drum could make call changes for the other drums, and then how a different drum could call changes. And and it just um, it, you know it really is communication language. Oh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, a lot of them, uh, for example, in uh, kinka drumming, uh, Bell is... Yeah, Kagan, the high, little high pitch, which is this drum here. So the, the lead drum goes, Gaze, get the get and the supporting drum goes. And that stands for the language of Be Boronoto. And the supporting drum goes Choba. Choba. Of Be Boronoto. Choba. So the language. Is right there, and you can adapt it to the drum set. Again, a manual has said, "Yeah, go ahead. It's really cool." And um, so, it, it makes a lot of sense to a drummer to hear these things and literally adapt them. Mm-hmm. I find that there are levels of adapting specific rhythms, like the bell pattern, which would be. Variation. So mm-hmm. all these things are adapting the X 
actual rhythms. But over the years, I've felt something more. Um, and I can't quite put it into words. It's a sensitivity or sensibility and attitude about playing itself. It's uh, physical, but from that physical thing, it goes to another place that's not so physical. For example, like, you know, you, you play some of the drums with your hands. Well, then adapt that for the whole drum set, and you can go like. It's not just that. There's something in it that is uh, interesting. It's not busy. That was busy. And that's what I played. But what I'm feeling when I really am playing it and even listening to it, there's something there that is the opposite. Mm -hmm. I know that might sound strange. But you know, there's the bell, the rattles, the dancers, everybody's moving. Kagan, Kiri, Sogo, Achimefu, bang, bang, you know, you're hitting. Or in the north, the, the gungong and the lunga, you know, it's going, everything is intense. Yes, it's true, it is. But there's another level too that's going on. There's the level of language, song, meaning, feel, the occasion it's for, all that's true. But even beyond that, there's something that I feel is very quiet. Now that, I may be sounding like I'm crazy, but it's actually what I feel in it. When I listen- When you say quiet, maybe could that mean peace or peaceful? Yeah, it, it, it's, but it's almost more than that. It's like a kind of peaceful, calm. Uh, in Korea, they have a saying of the dance and the music, the traditional music, movement and stillness stillness in movement which sounds like a contradiction you're like you can't be still in movement but it's true in the mm. same way with this intensity and passion but an inner calm an inner uh yeah like you're saying you're right peace it's like a a quiet mm -hmm. it's a quiet it's uh -huh. like it's a quiet there's intense sounds, bang, 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 right? Out to the universe, you're going to, but in that intensity, in that uh, sound, there's a stillness and a quiet. Uh -huh. Silence. Yes, yeah. funny, uh, that, that ring was a, with a teacher of mine, Bolakata Konde from Guinea. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> he must have heard the conversation, <laughs> even though we're not live. Uh, yeah. That's well, and also, I mean, for me, I've I've thought of it like a like a um, a physical meditation, like a movement sound meditation. Absolutely. And, and, and so, well, I really appreciate you talking with me. Um, I have I have one other question, if if you if you don't mind. Um, I, and this is, you can go into this however much you want or not, but um, how have you you know I you've already made it clear that you're you're not doing this for commerce, you're not doing it for the money, but how have you balanced the, the need to make a living and with making art, making music and, and, and what has been your approach throughout That's the year? Um, I was fortunate because at Wesleyan, I got my studies and I got a PhD and was able to get a teaching position at uh, part-time at Wesleyan first, then at the New School Jazz Program in New York for a couple of years before I was invited to teach at San Jose State. And from there back to UMass Dartmouth, which is a small branch of UMass Amherst down in Dartmouth near New Bedford where I live. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to get full professor and tenure and all those things. Uh -huh. 
I didn't really do it for that, honestly. I did got the PhD so I could play with all the master artists, quite frankly. I didn't even care about it. But uh -huh. I had that, so I used it and I had a choice to make um, whether to go to New York and just play or to stay in academia and still go to New York. At the time I was taking care of my mom. So I needed to stay in some kind of financial stability and be near her. So I did that. Uh, my dad had passed away before that. And so uh, I did that. And looking back, if it hadn't been for that, I would have gone to New York because I think I did definitely miss some time that I wanted to be there. But mm -hmm. I was very lucky because most of that time, a friend of mine who I met at UMass way before, a, a great social revolutionary and activist and composer and band leader, Fred Ho. I don't know if you've heard of him. He had a many big orchestras and revolutionary Afro-Asian music ensemble based in New York. Mm -hmm. And I got to tour all over the world with him and play across the country. And uh, so that brought me to New York a lot. So I was in New York, but just not living all the time. Back mm -hmm. the and uh, it was a great experience. And he passed away in 2014 of cancer, sadly. Mm -hmm. Great visionary. But that allowed me to be there. What I've done now, uh, uh, I've decided, and this may be uncommon, I'm not rich and I'm, you know, I have a retirement and I'm, I have food and medical care. That's it. I, but I'm not in any way rich. But I've decided I am not going to run through all the maze of success in the music scene, music business. Uh, there are others that might want to do that. And all power to them. I'm not in any way, there's no judgment of other people. But for myself, I can't do that. Even if I could, I don't think I would want to. I want to do the music not for status or money or ego or grabbing a romantic partner or any of that i just want it to be about the music and what that means for which for me is spiritual i don't want to go you know words around sound sentimental but that's what it is for me mm -hmm. and so i have a monthly series that i'm doing in new york and it's been at a great place called the michiko studios on west 46th and I'm now going to do some of them at an incredible community space up in Harlem on West 130th Street called mm -hmm. the Amsterdam Music, Music Association, which is a historic place. Um, so I'm trying to do it in places where the space is not telling me I have to advertise, although I do, and I, I don't have to fill so many seats and charge so much at the door and we'll give you 60% of the bar or, you know, no, no. I haven't been doing music all my life to run around doing that stuff. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's bad. I'm just saying I want to present the music for its own sake, not for the sake of somebody that needs to make a profit or sell so many drinks or fill so many seats or, you know, no. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I'm about. I, I just want to live the music. You know what I'm doing? I'm actually transferring the aesthetic and the cultural context, the community context that you've seen in Ghana, I'm transferring that vibe of an open hearted village where nobody's excluded. Everybody can come. You don't have to pay to get in. You just there as a human being and we respect you and we share this music from our insides. Mm -hmm. That's what you have in the village. And that's what I want to. Well, I am doing my best to create here in the US in New York and wherever I play. I want every time I play, no restrictions on who can get in. They don't have to jump through hoops or pay money they can't afford. If somebody wants to donate, you know, if it's a, for a benefit to help the community, yeah, great. Or if I'm selling something for the villages, yes. But no, no quotas on seat filled audience. Mm -hmm. None of that, but just for the music itself. That's what I believe. And I learned that again from tap dancing for audiences at UMass, Wesleyan, and then Ghana and the Philippines and Korea and China and the villages, Trinidad. Uh, just the music is a part of life. It's sacred. You can't put a dollar sign on it. You can't put your picture up there and miss. No, it's for the music, man. And that that's all I need. I don't need any drugs or anything forget that 
there's no high as good as this music. You don't need anything else. Uh, and so that's how I feel. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your story and, and sharing your knowledge of the music and your philosophy. I really appreciate it. And thank you to, to folks who are tuning in. in 11 and you know forget the numbers it's just it's not like you can count it one two three four five six seven eight nine eleven one two three four five six seven eight nine eleven or one two three four five and one two but it's really just the heartbeat a big one uh after hearing i didn't connect it the day i heard the night i heard mccoy tyner for four hours uh the next day i was at home with my parents and i heard this rhythm in my head i just what is this and it came out that it was this really cool rhythm. Actually, it was in, uh, I won't go to 11, I'll go to 15, it was in 15, but I didn't know it. I said, I gotta play that. So I played it on the drum set. Then I said, this is so cool. And I said, I, I gotta write this down so I don't forget it. So I wrote it down, only then did I know it was in what you'd call 15 or seven and a half. And it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Interesting with Duke Ellington's caravan, a little faster than that. So it was like this. And then I felt you could put these layers on fives and threes, so it came out like this. I'll put the hi hat in five.
Nice. Of these time cycles, which are, I felt that before I studied Indian music, but it fit right in with my studies in South India. But it came from my experience of hearing McCoy Tyner on that night at UMass that changed my life. I don't know how that came about. I have no idea. But it's just another heartbeat. And, you know, in my blood drum spirit, we do five, seven, nine, 15, 20, you know, whatever. But it isn't any of those things. Those are just different heartbeats. I don't like mm -hmm. to call them or sound mathematical. Yeah. That's just one example of it, which is very similar to the bell you hear in West Africa. Which you hear in 12A, but mm -hmm. it's just another heartbeat like that. And that swings. Seven and eleven and fifteen. That it, it grooves. Yeah. If you didn't tell me what time signature, I may not even think about it. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It's yeah. just feel of a heartbeat, and that's part of this discussion of time. What is time? What is life? How does time express life? From world traditions like West Africa, India, Caribbean, Philippines, all those things come together to express life through sound and movement, mm -hmm. dance and drumming. Hence, blood, drum, spirit. And these time cycles each have a life, just like the bell patterns of West Africa and the Kulintang of Philippines and Opera of Beijing and all that. So that's just a little bit of slice I wanted to connect with what we had talked about. And uh, maybe for another time, we can go into some of those ideas about drumming and life as well.